All right, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. This is a special report, Keeping the Peace. My name is Bob Bianchi. It's June 22nd, 2020. The Louisville mayor in the Breonna Taylor case has announced the firing of one of the officers involved in firing 10 shots and killing the 26-year-old EMT. Let's take a listen to the mayor's statement. Chief Schroeder is today initiating termination procedures against Louisville Metro Police Officer Brett Hankison. Unfortunately, due to a provision in state law that I very much would like to see changed, both the chief and I are precluded from talking about what brought us to this moment or even the timing of this decision. I know that you will have questions, and I'm sorry that I cannot answer them because of the state law, ARS Chapter 67C, point three two six one F. I have Brian Watkins with me, a famous and very great trial attorney. I've covered a case with him with Kellen Winslow, where we did gavel to gavel coverage on the Law and Crime Network. He did an amazing job. Thanks, Brian, for coming. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, so what do you think about this announcement? And what do you think about the mayor saying that he can't speak about this? Well, you know, that's half the problem with the police. They have so many protections in place. They can't be fired. If they kill someone, all they have to say is, I feared for my life, and they get off scot-free. And it's those protections that need to be done away with. Um, what's currently being done right now is the law of qualified immunity, which makes officers immune from civil lawsuits. That law is being attacked and undone, actually, in some states, including here in California. Yeah, we're going to get to that a little bit later. But, you know, there are reasons why they have these laws that you can't speak. Uh, it's it's basically not to try the case in a court of public opinion. And we're seeing a lot of changes with regard to this. I know as a former prosecutor, I was very limited in the amount of information I could give, it, give out. And as a trial attorney, I'm interested in your point of view about should these cases be played out in court or should there be more transparency? You know, there should be more transparency. And when I say that, it should be more transparency in court. When we go up, up against a cop and want to sue a cop and want to go into that cop's background and say this cop is using excessive force, we have to follow what we call pitches motions and motions. And we have to jump over all these legal hurdles to get this officer's background. Now, if this officer has been using excessive force with others and has other complaints against them, clearly that's relevant. And it shouldn't be so difficult to get that information. They should not try to hide that information from lawyers or the public, to tell you the truth. Now, Brian, you bring up something in my civil rights days when I was doing 1983 litigation. Uh, it was a trauma. That's the word I would use, trauma to get information as simple as the police officer's disciplinary record and how many times we would have to go to court on motion after motion after motion to eke out information. So I have like a different point of view. It's one thing to be discussing this in the public, but it's another thing about giving the lawyers access to information, which I think is one of the most critical things that we're still missing here in terms of reform. We need to know the internal affairs records because that's how you build a 1983 civil rights action. With thoughts? Absolutely. And it's not just information, it's evidence. It's evidence to support your case that this officer is continually doing wrongdoing, misconduct, or using excessive force. So that information should not be, you know, concealed from the attorneys and say, well, you can't use this as evidence that he's a bad cop in your case to try to prove that he's a bad cop. It makes right, no just, sense. Just so our audience understands, on the 1983 litigation, if, if that's the civil rights statute that we have, 42 U.S.C. 1983, if you have a custom practice or policy of deliberate indifference, that's an actual quote from the law, and how you prove that based on a case Beck versus the city of Pittsburgh, for all of you uh, aficionados out there, civil rights aficionados, is by showing a prior bad internal affairs record because they're allowing the cop to act lawlessly. And that's why it's so important, Brian, to make sure that we have that basic information in order to be able to support or investigate even whether we should file a complaint for police brutality. Exactly. Like I said before, it's not even information. It's actually evidence. I mean, and that's what you present in a court of law is evidence. And his prior bad acts are actually evidence in a 1983 action that would support or disprove you know, a pattern of bad conduct. So it can't, I don't see anything any more, can be more relevant than that. Yeah, the police chief had, uh, uh, the acting chief had something to say with regard uh, to this as well. And uh, essentially the writing that the chief is saying is using words like deliberate indifference. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking these are very carefully chosen words, Brian, that they are talking about a standard that could support a criminal negligent homicide or a reckless manslaughter kind of charge in that state. What do you think? I do. You know, the, the, you know the, that's, again, a part of the problem that we have with 
our police departments and policing the police is that the laws are very protective against them. And when you talk about a standard such as deliberate indifference, I've done many, many, many 1983 actions, and it almost amounts to doing it on purpose. You know, and that's very difficult to prove in a lot of cases because you, you're talking about an officer involved shooting where someone dies, and you say that he did it on purpose. Well, then you're saying first degree murder, and that's just that's a standard that's too high to obtain. Yeah, and, and also the thing I loved about 1983 litigation is there's also companion state civil rights laws that you can bring as well. And to your point, you're absolutely right that deliberate indifference standard is almost like the person did it on purpose. And then when you add qualified immunity on top of that, although I've been successful in these litigations, it's, it's a rough road. Sometimes the state civil rights laws are even better. And I think we're going to see a turn, Brian, what do you think? with uh, probably more of the liberal states starting to make it easier to file civil rights claims under state law due to the fact it's so hard to do it under the federal law. Yes, I agree with that 100%, and I see it out here in California. Um, there is a big push. You know, our Black Lives Movement is huge here in California. This is becoming a blue, bluer and bluer state. And I think that if the federal laws don't catch up, I think California will lead the way. And we'll start following these things in state court. You know, we have the same um, mechanisms for, you know, remedies that we would in federal court. There's just a little bit of difference, you know, as far as the discovery process is concerned. And here's another big thing is that, you know, and I do file these in state court sometimes. Why? Because our jury pool is a little different. You know, our jury pool is based on people with driver's license, DMV records, and the federal jury pools are voter registration, and they seem to be more conservative. So, I see a lot of cases going to be filed now in uh, in state court. So, Brian, let's go a little bit to the facts of this case, though. I mean, these officers are executing a court-authorized search warrant, a no-knock search warrant, as it's called, because supposedly packages of drugs are being delivered to a male um, at or about that location. Brian, what is happening? And I'm a law enforcement supporter, okay? And, and when, as a prosecutor, I had to make sure that they were doing the right job. So we prosecuted a number of officers as well. We tried to, to have that balance. But is it is this training? I mean, I, I don't believe the cop went in there to shoot and kill somebody, but what is happening firing 10 rounds without even seeing anybody? I mean, anybody could have been killed in there, a completely innocent person. I'll tell you exactly what's happening. And I'll tell you exactly the problem with police reform. It's not hiring more minority police chiefs. It's not diversity in hiring. It's not more sensitivity training. It's none of that. What it is, is this simple fact. The police department's driving policy. The police department's main policy is officer safety. The number one rule a cop has is come home safe. And that is a problem. It's really not that dangerous of a job, but it is a dangerous job. And the problem it, with, with it is, is that your safety becomes second when officer safety becomes first. Now you look at other occupations, lifeguards, you're in the big waves and the, and the riptide's about to drown. They jump in those same big waves and the serious riptide and risk their life when they could drown to save you. Firemen, right. they go to the fire. And what are they doing? They're saving property. What's property? Okay, so they're risking their lives to save property. The bottom line here is cops need to risk their lives. The problem is, is that they say, hey, I'm shooting first and asking questions later. Right. My number one it's... reason is I'm coming home tonight. I right. don't care what's going on. And that's why when there's a little hint of danger, I'm getting out of there. I'm shooting. I'm doing whatever. I don't care. OK, Brian, listen, I agree. And I think uh, my friends tell me that our law enforcement, since they're not putting hands on people anymore and using more of their weapons and tasers and being trained that way, that that's a major problem. We got to take a quick break. We got a lot more coming up on the show. Stick with us. Rashard Brooks, the man who was shot in the back by police in Atlanta, will be laid to rest in funeral today. Um, obviously, a very insightful case here. Uh, it, a lot of people very agitated about this. Uh, officers are going to be held accountable for this. There's no question about it. But we have a clip that we'd like to show you with regard uh, to the victim speaking about fatherhood. Let's take a listen. I feel like sh it should be a way to, for you to have some kind of person, like a mentor assigned to you to you know, keep your track, keep you in the direction you need to be going or, you know, certain things, you know, that you just can't do. You know, I feel like 
I mean, y'all took the time to lock me up and didn't, you know, didn't care. You know, I was sitting in there, but hey, yet I'm out now and I, I have to try to fend for myself when I've been taken away from, you know, society. And, you know, now I have to go out here, you know, clueless of everything that's been going on. I don't know. I'm trying to adapt back to society, you know, and I have to go clueless of things. You know, trying to figure out, hey, which way do I go? We have to go back and try to fix things with our kids and, you know, try and gain that trust back, you know, with being away. You know, my oldest daughter, Dad, you know, she's, hey, I love you so much, but where have you been? You know, and I have to, you know, feather up the energy to let her know everything that has went on within me and the, the situation that I have been through. It's hurting us, but it's hurting our family the most. You know, so as we go through these trials and tribulations, it, it, it's, 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 it's hurting our kids and it's, it's, it's taking away from our families. You know, the sole provider, the male figure or the female figure, you know, I'm speaking for both. And it's taking away from us. Okay, there you go. Um, Brian Watkins, a, an excellent trial attorney. Uh, we covered gavel to gavel coverage on the Kellen Winslow case and uh, was very impressed as a trial lawyer myself and a former prosecutor. Uh, and I think you did a great job. So I'm going to ask you to put on your criminal defense lawyer hat on for this one. If you were representing the police officer, give us an idea, Brian, how you would be going about, what would you be thinking? How would you be going about it? Talk about what, you're, what the conversation's like in the room with the client. Are you going to the prosecutor and seeing if you can cut a deal? Tell us, tell us Brian Watkins' way of going about this. Well, first and foremost, yeah, I want to get into my client's head and figure out what really happened and, and find his story in this. And I think I would focus a lot of the attention on Mr. Brooks and his actions. Okay, and what his role was in this situation and why it ended up the way it did. He had a lot to play in that, and that's the bottom line. Um, he was, there was an interview and, and some questioning that was polite and fine. And had Mr. Brooks continued on that, and, and, and you know, the officers do have the authority, and if he was gonna get arrested, his time to go and deal with it is in court. But he chose not to. He chose to deal with it out there in that parking lot physically. And that was something that would lead my client to have to react to it. And that's what I would focus on is Mr. Brooks's actions um, and just the response that my client had, how reasonable it was in relation to Mr. Brooks' unreasonable actions. So, Brian, tell us when you're talking to the client, though, and I know this puts you in a difficult spot, you don't have all the evidence, <clears throat> but you do, you do have the tape here. Um, are you advising your client that you have concerns, irrespective of what you just said, and that it's probably better to try to get to the prosecutor to see if you can try to do some mitigation here and uh, help him out with regard to some sort of plea deal? Or are you not prepared to do that at this point in time when you're, if you were representing him? Absolutely. You know, the bottom line here is we got a guy shot in the back as he was fleeing. You cannot shoot a fleeing suspect. So it's very difficult to get over that hurdle, you know? And so we do want to appreciate, although we want to focus the attention on Mr. Brooks and put his bad actions in the spotlight, we don't have to put our heads in the sand as to our actions. And the bottom line here, this came down to shooting a fleeing man in the back. Now, the good point, you know, on, on our case would be Mr. Brooks did disarm my client and then turned and fired the taser at my client. So a taser can be, although it's not a deadly weapon, it can be an incapacitating weapon. So I focus on that and say, hey, if my guy got incapacitated and he's on the ground shivering and, and barely conscious, you know, his firearm can be taken and he can be assaulted. He can be, you know, seriously hurt. She could suffer great bodily injury. That is the standard that I need to prove to say, hey, my client fired because he was in reasonable fear of suffering great bodily injury. And the great bodily injury would come from Mr. Brooks having already punched me in the face and already assaulted me, now turning my weapon, my taser on me to further incapacitate me. And at that point, I think I meet the standard of, was I in reasonable fear of suffering great bodily injury? I don't have to need necessarily be in reasonable fear of suffering death, 
And a taser, I don't think, would kill you. It's not a deadly weapon. But if I can have to, if I have to suffer great bodily injury, I can use deadly force, and that's what I keep the focus on. Mr. Brooks's action and and my my client's response to it, and why it was so reasonable. Right, you know, and they always say there's always one gun in a police encounter, at least. And your point about the incapacitation and these officers' training about that weapon can be taken from you uh, is is a good point to make. Uh, talk to me a little bit about juror psychology here. It has been said for many years that it's very difficult uh, to prosecute cop cases. I can tell you that first firsthand. But has have these movements? Uh, do you think going to change that jury psychology, or do you still think you're going to get jurors that are going to sit there and, to your point, say, you know, that defense lawyer Brian Watkins is right. This guy started the encounter, didn't have to go that way. He turned around and fired the taser. Could have incapacitated him. Can you get one juror to say, I'm not convicting that cop? You know, in today's climate, the climate has certainly changed. You know, I was head of the litigation. I, our case, the lead case, uh, Demetrius DeBose, with an NFL football player who was shot and killed out here in San Diego, shot seven times in the back, back in 1999, I'm aging myself a little bit. And that litigation led to the police implementing non-lethal tools, such as beanbag guns, the tasers, and such. And that's why San Diego has them, because of that litigation back in 1999, with the death of Demetrius DuBose. The climate has absolutely changed now because there's been continued over and over again these incidences from Ferguson, I mean, from Rodney King, I should say, Ferguson, all the way through to now, over and over again, the same type of actions being done. And the cops saying their one get out of jail free card excuse, such as, I feared for my safety, and that gets them scot free. The climate now has changed with these protests. And, uh, and, I, and I think that, you know, and I say this unfortunately, I think that jurors are weighed and a lot of things are, things are political now. Uh, it would be very tough to get a fair jury to tell you the truth. It's going to be some severe, intensive void there because I think jurors are going to be concerned about, man, if I let these people go and I really don't feel that he should be found guilty, but if I let him go, are there going to be riots? That's what happened in Rodney King. Rodney King Protests and riots didn't occur after people saw the videotape beating of Rodney King. It was after the officers were acquitted of beating Rodney King that we had the riots. And now with these nationwide protests and some turning into riots and looting, I think the jurors are going to be concerned um, about that. And will that sway their opinion? Yes, they're human beings. Um, so yes, you know, that's, that, that is absolutely a concern. Can I think these cops can get a fair trial? I mean, this climate is going to be very tough. Yeah, Brian, you know, we talked about this a little bit before about training and the culture uh, in the previous segment, the previous block. And I want to go back to what uh, my tactical operations captain once told me about a lot of what's happening in the last couple of years. Uh, what are your thoughts about his belief that because police officers, especially the younger ones, are being trained to use mechanical force, uh, least at least less than lethal weapons like tasers and their firearm as constructive authority force, uh, as opposed to putting hands on people? They're, they're, they would try to move away from, he said back in the day, he used to just scrap with somebody. They'd roll around or whatever, and then they may move on. That this is happening as a training issue. What do you think? You know, that's a, that's a great point. And I've always been of the consensus, and, and this may sound harsh, but yeah, cops, if you're allowed to shoot and kill someone because you're afraid, you shouldn't be allowed to be afraid very easily. And that's what okay. we have here. That's what we, that, well, the, the bottom line is Breonna Taylor, that's what happened. The cops got scared and they just started firing and going crazy. In this case, the guy is running away. Is he scared? Yeah, he's scared, but you can't go to deadly force. The funny thing is, is, you know, I used to be a bouncer. There's bouncers all across the world. And we dealt with people that had weapons, knives, guns, broken pool cues, broken bottles. We had no authority. We had a t-shirt on that said security. Okay. In my case, the word security wasn't even spelled right. And we dealt with these people. We put our hands on them, and we got them under control and dealt with them, and we now never we, shot and killed anyone. Why, now we know why you're a bad lawyer in that courtroom. Bad as in good, I mean. <laughs> uh, you had good training. Hey, listen, Colorado's uh, changed the law. No more qualified immunity, uh, Brian. Let's go back to what that means. So qualified immunity, on top of a difficulty that we talked about before in civil rights litigation, proving a case for a plaintiff or that as a victim of police brutality, is a good faith but erroneous belief in the lawfulness of their conduct. So if there was a good faith yet erroneous belief, you used to be entitled to qualified immunity, which means you couldn't sue the police. Now, let's be clear here. Immunities in the law cover all sorts of people 
including all sorts of government employees, police officers included, even lawyers arguing in a courtroom. Qualified immunity is there supposedly as a policy interest in order to have those officials and people like us in a courtroom feel free to speak our minds without worrying about being sued for every little mistake that we make or every error we make. So, Brian, with that in uh, consideration, what are your thoughts about this new law in Colorado where you can, the police officers especially, can no longer rely on qualified immunity, good or bad? Absolutely great. The law of qualified immunity was one of the major problems with police misconduct because they could stand behind that and be absolutely immune from any sort of liability at all. Now, you say that lawyers and other government officials have it, not to the extent that the police have. If lawyers make a mistake, we're liable. It's called malpractice. Doctors make a mistake, it's called malpractice. Now, for example, I'm a lawyer. We do civil cases, personal injury, wrongful deaths, auto accidents, that sort of thing. If I don't file your, your lawsuit within the statute of limitations, I, I may have done a good faith, you know, I didn't do it on purpose. I maybe thought that the date was the 10th and it turned out to be the 9th. I'm still liable for my mistake. And if an officer says, yeah, well, I thought that he had a gun and he was going to kill me, and it turns out he didn't have a gun and he wasn't going to kill you, he needs to be liable for that. But the way the law stands right now, he's not. And as long as he had a good faith belief, well, that's the reason I thought him is because I thought I had a gun. Well, did you see a gun? Well, no, but I still thought it. That's enough for them to walk away. And that's the problem. And so I'm absolutely for getting rid of the law of qualified immunity. When cops have the ability to kill you, to take your life, those decisions need to be more scrutinized and they shouldn't be immune from making the wrong call. Brian, we only got a real short window of time, a couple seconds, uh, 45 seconds left. Do you believe that this is going to dissuade people from entering into government service? At least that's the argument being made in two, in 15 seconds or less. Um, do you think that there's political will to do this federally? I don't know with the current administration whether there's political will to do this federally, whether it's going to dissuade people to go into law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a very popular job right now. I don't think cops would even be at a restaurant oh. or bar saying be proud gotcha. of their occupation. So it's tough. All right, Brian Watkins, you are the real deal. We greatly appreciate you coming on the show. We're a regular scheduled program. We'll be starting. Stay with us at the Long Prime Network. We'll be back tomorrow.